Hello and welcome back. Welcome back. Um, I hope you have managed to have a little bit of a break. Uh, we are looking into the future now, but not actually that far into the future, only about three to five years. We're looking at the evolution of humanitarian logistics and the supply chain in the years ahead. So we want to get a sense of how you think well, in the best of all possible worlds, we want to ask you what it's going to look like, but we also want to ask you what you think will be the main influences. So we do need you to be on Menti for this, just to have a look at that, maybe add a few things, but we also want to talk to people on microphone. So um, if you haven't got Menti open, it's 10, 34, 21, 21. We are putting some statements on there that you can decide whether you think they are going to be the most influential uh, aspects over the next three three to six years we'll say three to six years we want to vote them up so if you think for instance that it's going to be the economic effects of covid that's number one you can vote it up but we also want people to talk about it so uh, and we want you to add your own ideas so we're putting on about five sort of pre-cooked suggestions that could be the influences for the next few years ahead um, and this is on, you know, just what you think is likely to be the greatest influence on your world in the next few years. We'll put some suggestions, you add to them, but we also want to bring you in to talk about it and get some more detail on that. So I hope it's clear. Um, so I'm still where I'm not, let me just see, I'm not seeing anything loaded already yet. Oh, yes, there we are. So that was the first one is the backlash of, of COVID-19 um, and reduced funding. Another one we're going to put on is digitization um, will lead to stronger lo localization. No, that's am I on the right? Have I got the right page? I'm not sure I've got the right page in front of me, but let's have a look. Just wait to see whether we get some more. Um, just in terms of COVID, let me already bring, I already want to bring somebody in from the audience because uh, we haven't heard enough from people live. So is there somebody who's going to be brave enough to open up their microphones and their cameras? I'm going to, otherwise I'll ask somebody specifically. Do, who do I know there? Do, Sean Rafter, I'm, I've just come across your name from Help Logistics. I just, this was, um, just scrolling through, Sean, would you like to, to unmute your microphone and put your camera on if you're there? Are you there, Sean? Hi, Cathy, can you hear me? Yes, I can, oh, that's great. We've got, a, we've, got, we've got a member of the audience, that's perfect. So where do you see the main influences? I mean, for instance, let's talk about the backlash of, of COVID. Are there any other elements that you think will be uh, really influential? Yeah, I was doing some thinking about this with colleagues at uh, the Kuna University, uh, where they're um, regularly um, looking at the mega trends in uh, commercial and humanitarian uh, supply chain logistics. Um, and I think we were able to kind of summarize in, in, in three areas. Um, one is the opposing drivers, if you like, of sustainability and resilience. Uh, on the one hand, um, environmental sustainability um, is, is a necessity, and, um, but we are also seeing that uh, the cost of response um, is going up. So building back resilient uh, supply chain networks um, is almost um, inevitable and necessary. Uh, but to do that, sustainability will have a, a financial impact and a cost. Um, so that's, that's kind of one one area and certainly decarbonization uh, in the freight and logistics um, domain is, is ongoing and, and happening. So um, that's uh, a strong driver, I think. The other one is, is of course, digitalization, um, which uh, in the commercial sector uh, within five years is, is going to be transformational in terms of uh, how logistics is happening. I think the interconnectivity and interoperability of supply chain is going to be fascinating. Um, as we heard from uh, about blockchain, um, these are uh, all possibilities, but I think the governance and control over those are going to be the opposing forces against that enablement. 
Well, what about um, digitization then? One of the suggestions we, we've put here is that it could create a further rift between small and large or local and international organizations. Yeah, interestingly, we, we um, spoke uh, at a conference in uh, Africa last year and uh, digitalization 4.0 is um, proudly kind of purported to um, really revolutionize um, Africa in terms of in, in providing it a huge enabling um, uh, factor for, for creating new economies uh, and improving um, the economies there in, in Africa. But there are the restrictions of access uh, to those uh, technologies, whether it's the infrastructure uh, investment or whether it's the um, access to the actual technology itself, uh, the hardware uh, and the software. But um, yeah, we do have to be mindful that it potentially is another um, way to separate uh, the haves and have nots. Yeah, yeah. Let me bring in Jason Asimovich. I think I've said that right. Um, looking at my list, you're from Penn State University. Is that right? Hi, thank you. Yeah, I'm from Penn State University. Uh, thanks for this. Yeah, I guess looking at this, um, you know, we see digitization up there a bunch and cash based programming uh, and the great talk uh, from Professor Ndemo just a, a little bit ago. And I guess building on what Sean was saying, I mean, I guess the big question is how do you leverage all of that? How do you leverage digitization um, in a way that's efficient for the beneficiaries? Um, so it's possible what you might see is a fragmentation of your 3PLs, sort of like the, uh, to use a cliche, the Uberization uh, of, of the sector where once digitization takes off and cash-based programming takes off, uh, then you have 3PLs. And this could be small humanitarian organizations that are local, or they could be large players, but uh, the digitization can enable a wide variety of folks to come in and provide those services. Uh, just, where... just let me start, you explain what you mean by the Uberization then. You're talking about uh, what one big sort of platform, like just an Amazon. Just a platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where it's more platform based. And so you've got a platform that says, here's the need uh, and either the beneficiaries have the cash to pay for it, as we heard from Professor Ndemo, uh, or some donors such as the government are paying for that need. But the platform puts the need out there and then any organization or individual can start to fill that need uh, via this platform. Now, is this a good or a bad thing though? Oh yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I mean, it could be good, right? In the sense that you, if you've got some transparency, you can, uh, better understand, as we were listening a little bit ago, you can better understand where the cash or where the goods are going and better understand where the need is. Uh, you can create competition in delivery services uh, so that there's an incentive to do it efficiently and maybe the, there's a financial incentive to do it efficiently. Um, but what about cash-based um, operations, though? What are the pluses and, and minuses of that? Yeah, I think, I mean, th this is a debate that's, that's a huge, bigger debate than what I'm an expert in, uh, to, be, to be honest. I mean, the benefits, uh, Professor Ndema sort of emphasized them just in the sense that instead of trying to impose this is what we think is needed, uh, this is how we think it should be delivered. If you're a free market type person, then you just let the market figure it out. You put cash in the hands of the people who are spending it. And then those who can bring it quickest and most efficiently uh, are incentivized to do so. It's got a lot of problems. There's the privacy problems that uh, we heard brought up just in terms of how do you track it. Um, and then there might be many situations where firms, private firms are not, the financial incentive is not there to bring the goods there, such as water, as we heard, or some other goods. And that's where the non-cash-based program and the, the in-kind donations needs to come in. 
Thank you very much indeed for that. And let me bring in Danielle German. You've got your hand up. Um, tell me which organisation you're from, Danielle. Um, and just, just, I mean, you maybe comment on the fact that the that people are talking about the backlash of COVID-19 and the economic effects as being the number one influencer. Are you there, Danielle? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm with UNFPA. Um, okay. And I think, you know, the COVID component, I think, touches on some of the other areas which I also think are important to bring up here. One of them is kind of this, I would say the trend toward reduced replication. And I think it connects a little bit to what was said in the last comment, but especially within humanitarian actors, like we've seen this with COVID, the, the pooled procurement that came about, the pooled common logistics services operated and coordinated by WFP at a scale that was has not been seen in the past. And you know whether it's within the UN or, or across humanitarian actors, this idea to kind of have these, I would say, not back end services, but common services of things like logistic, which are not mandate specific um, and where that means for us, because I also think that, you know, the private sector can only provide so much because what happens and we've seen this with some of, you know, you know, even things like recycling, which we do, you know, in, in Europe or, or in other countries which are not humanitarian is this idea of what happens when humanitarian need doesn't align with where the profitable investment is and how do you balance that as a sector. So I also think that, you know, there's this increased trend toward the interaction with the private sector, which I think is is great, but then there's also going to be this continued need to understand what the balance is between what the private sector can provide and what us as humanitarian organizations who are obliged to follow humanitarian principles can provide. And I think that this connects to the last two things, which, which I also would like to raise, which is climate change, which I think has also come up quite a lot. And not just in terms of you know green procurement and green logistics, but also localized procurement and localized logistic. And even with COVID, you know, not everything can be done via cash, right? I think of pharmaceuticals, medical devices, things like this, which are not direct to consumer or beneficiary. And in these instances, you're always going to have some need for quality assurance. But the investment in the sector around localizing these things um, is required. And then on the, you know, that's a procurement perspective. But then what does that mean for logistic? And what does that mean for then global logistic operations and global freight forwarders and the interactions with those actors versus, you know, the contractual arrangements and, and, and you know, leveraging local logistic providers and, uh, and, and service providers. Yeah, excuse me. Okay, well, some interesting points there. Let me bring in Martin from Malteser. Yeah, hello, good day. Hello. Uh, okay, we, we, we talked uh, about um, new influencers maybe that that they come that will come in three to six years of course but in the end we also have to have to um, keep in mind that some influ influencers will will stay the same for example access to affected areas when we think about political crisis or areas with armed conflicts of course and in my point of view uh, customs will will always be an issue also in the uh, in three years or in the however um, how much years this will be an issue. <laughs> for a stupid example, we are trying to get an import, import authorization for Kolar kids since the beginning of February. It's completely terrible to get things in some countries. And of course, um, what, is also, what was also mentioned is um, money. Yeah? For example, money will always be an influence. So when we talk about sudden onset uh, disasters where short reaction time is key, smaller NGO, NGOs will always have a problem to pre-finance, for example, um, their, uh, yeah. And so they admit- What they want to do, yeah, for example, uh, may maybe somebody is not able to, to pre-finance 20,000 euros only to bring uh, uh, goods from A to B. Yeah, and of course, the digitalization, it's, it's always the same. And, that, and the, the point that you already mentioned, and everybody, every type of organization has to cope with this. And they are... And would you say that the administrative b burdens are becoming worse or... or, or and then how, how, is, is there any answer to that? <laughs> Good question. Um... I mean, localization to a certain extent and cash-based payments sort of and then it, to a certain extent can help, can it not? Uh, I'm not sure, sorry. I'm not sure. I, can give, I can't give an answer on that. No. And, and in terms of digitalization, I mean, do you think that can make stronger localization? <laughs> no. at, at least there must be a common standard, something like that, a basis yeah. um, where everybody can work with, yeah? 
And when when there would be something like that, then it's maybe possible or better possible. Let's say it like this. Let me bring Tom Olson in, please. Uh, Tom, tell me where where you're from. Yeah, thank you. You can hear me. Yeah, perfectly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Tom Olson, I'm uh, with UNICEF. UNICEF. Um, no, it's a very interesting discussion actually, um, and it, I think it's two things which worries me. Well, it's good, but it's all at the same time worries me because the uh, digitalization and 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 platforms for me are tools or are part of the enablers. I think the challenge we are having as humanitarian actors is that everybody wants to have ownership of it instead of uh, being agreeing on which platform should be used under those kind of circumstances. And I can give you an example when I went to Fiji some years ago to support the operation there during the uh, in the aftermath of a cyclone and uh, log cluster came was there as well and very much focused on information management and I thought that was really good because I didn't have to do that and what I think was even better uh, in terms of when we start looking at um, the response and the humanitarian uh, response versus development and we worked at that time log cluster also was very much um, or and strongly working together with the government. So we were all was in the same meeting together with the government officials uh, and others. And the whole platform, the whole information management was done by the log cluster. So we all had access to the same information instead of each and every agency coming in trying to have their name written on the wall. And I think that should be one of the concepts as we are moving forward and start thinking about the way the, the way because system and system strengthening either we're talking about a, a pure supply chain strengthening system and humanitarian need and development should be done within a system and a government that's from that's to me it's it's development part of a, a humanitarian uh, response but when you talk about the name being written on the wall and the ownership but really there is inevitably going to be more mergers in the sector aren't there and um aren't there going to be some there's going to be some blood on the carpet in the sense that you know that that some names will have to disappear will they not if the sector is going to survive or is that too extreme a, a picture for the future i don't think they will no every will everybody will have their niche on it but not but in terms of information 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 sharing and how each and every agency or organization contribute to to, to it needs to be better coordinated. So when I'm saying written on the wall, doesn't mean that UNICEF always have to be the one doing everything um, or any other agencies, or we have to learn to share and not necessarily become one, but deliver as one. And, and that, think, that, that potentially can bring in much smaller organizations and can bring a much more sort of local aspect to the work as well. Absolutely. And that's where we start looking at when we're talking about accountability to affected population is that we all each and every one, we have so many good NGOs, local and international, who are able to do things that we, well, let me say not we, but in many cases, UNICEF cannot do either in terms of access, in terms of being small and lean, and we rely heavily on them. As a UNICEF organization, we heavily develop uh, depending on local NGOs and other international NGOs to work together with us. That's to me is partnership. Thank mm. you. So, right, thank you. Very strong message there. Um, let me bring in Zare Hossein now. Where are you? Yeah, yeah. You Hello. Where are you? Where are you from? Sorry, I mean uh, probably the rest of the audience knows exactly um, what organisation you are, but tell us anyway. Sure, I'm talking from uh, Coventry University. I'm a researcher at uh, Coventry University UK. Oh, I know it well. Okay, very good. So, um, uh, very interesting discussions uh, made by uh, the rest of audience. And I just want to uh, highlight one point here. Uh, we are talking about the future of uh, humanitarian logistics and humanitarian context in general. And uh, there are issues about um, environmental sustainability, blockchain, new technologies, and um, cash-based programs and things like that. These are the hot topics at the moment, right? So I think what uh, will be very important in, in future is that when we are bringing these uh, new concepts into the foreground 
of humanitarian, uh, then we need to see the interplay and the interactions and probably the spillovers uh, that these um, concepts might, might have. Um, let me make an example. For example, when we are talking uh, about cash-based programs, um, it, it seems to be uh, functioning very well when where there is a functioning market, uh, we give cash to beneficiaries and they buy whatever uh, they actually need instead of giving them the uh, material or the um, humanitarian uh, assistant items. But um, have we studied or have we considered the impact of these cash-based programs on environmental sustainability, for example, uh, because we are talking about uh, humanitarian setting and probably beneficiaries will go for uh, the uh, lowest price, which, um, which might be the least environmentally sustainable option in that case. So uh, now we are giving the material that uh, usually the procurement department of humanitarian organizations, they have already done some uh, audits from the suppliers, some quality checks that there are no, for example, hazardous materials or things like that. But when we are giving cash, um, that is out of our control as a humanitarian organization. So we need to, when we are talking about the future uh, of humanitarian, we need to consider these interplays and interactions between these emerging concepts. And, and so can you potentially set any conditions on ca cash based programs or is that just too complicated? No, I think uh, th there is very little control when uh, when we are talking about um, beneficiaries. We, uh, humanitarian, uh, on the contrary to commercial setting, where there is a lot of market research and uh, data about uh, the behavior of consumers on humanitarian, we have very little knowledge, whether in practice or in in research about. Uh, what is the behavior of uh, beneficiaries, what they do and actually what they want. So um, I, I really uh, cannot think of uh, what conditions can we make and even if we make one, how we can ensure that we are going to implement that. Okay, no, well, it's, it's some good points there. Thank you very much indeed. Christian uh, Gronor, do you have your hand up? Uh, uh, you're from uh, D the Danish Refugee Council. I found you on my list. Are you there, Christian? No, he's not. Uh, yes, I'm here. You are, you are, you are. It just took um, some time for the host to find me. So that's Oh, well, fantastic. we've got you, we've got you. Yeah. Um, oh, just, okay. just to say as well, we tr what I want to try to do a little bit now is to shift the conversation, not just to um, the, 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 the biggest influences on the humanitarian sector, but also to look at, I mean, it's, people have already touched upon this a little bit too, but, um, what should the sector look like in the best of all possible worlds? What do we need to do? You know, um, if you know, I suppose really, if resources were not an issue, but let's be try and be quite realistic. Uh, but what should the sector look like as well? But anyway, Christian, sorry, tell me, tell well, me. That's, what, a, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I wanted to build on what has been said already, and, and yeah. some, of the, some of the comments that have been made for the last speaker. One of the things that we're doing in Danish Refugee Council is that we're looking at also for cash-based programming, building up the marketplace, right? So that we make sure that there is a certain quality, there is certain things that are available. We do make sure that there is a minimum standard or a minimum amount of items available. Um, but the point I wanted to make for the, for the future is to look at where the private industry is going and that is the creation of ecosystems. So in the old days, it was a one-to-one -one relationship between buyer of supply chain and and the the, uh, the seller, right? Then it became a one to many, and now it, it's going towards a many to many uh, relationship. So what I think we will see is that we will have many niche experts that will work together and consolidate demand or consolidate the way they are operating, and going out to then another group of people that can deliver the services. So you will have a many to many relationship whereby there will be collaboration across. We saw the beginnings of it. I was I was representing a bunch of NGOs on the UN COVID-19 supply chain task force. Um, that there's an understanding now from the UN system and some of the NGOs that we're moving to more collaborative uh, operations. And nobody is big enough to be able to do it alone. We need to.
collaborate between each other. We need to break down the, the, the somewhat artificial barriers between the various agencies and NGOs. And we need to find a way of how can we share resources better, all right? So that if something, someone is a, a specific expert on something, they can find those external resources that they need. So they can tap into the logistics network in order to get logistics. They can tap into a legal network to get legal help, et cetera, et cetera. And is this bringing in the private sector as well? It could bring in the private sector as well in the sense that that private sector could probably um, team up to offer up solutions to NGOs as such, right? But um, you seemed a little bit reluctant there. Is there a, a, a bit of a reluctance in the sector or is it a sort of, is it no, we, you know, we want everybody involved? What would you say? I, 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 think, I think the problem so far is that as NGOs, we are not large enough to engage directly with the main private sector, right? I am forced to often go via a trader and a trader is transactional. They're not really into a long-term relationship. So every single NGO is not large enough to enter into that global agreement with a end user, right? If we pull together, we will have enough clout to be able to go and, and deal directly with some of the multinationals or some of the larger companies and get direct access to the services or get direct access to the information, et cetera, et cetera. And here the log cluster can be a, an avenue to do that because through the collaboration, we would have sufficient market cloud, so to speak, to dictate and say, this is what we want to do. We saw that uh, in, in the COVID-19, the UN pulled together the demand, we were able to go directly to manufacturers and skip all the, all the middlemen. And I think you can see that in a, in a collaborative so when uh, you, you mentioned COVID-19, I mean, this is, is coming up as the number one influence for the future, but potentially there are, are some good lessons learned, one assumes, from COVID in the sense that you've just given an example of something that you, you did then and you can continue. Do you think that there are elements that more remote uh, services, for instance, that, that have had to happen and will continue to happen because of COVID? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's changing the way that we operate. I think we have to look a lot at our on our on our business models, in lack of a better term, and we need to strike that balance about how do we have local presence. We saw that it was very difficult to get staff out to do things. So how do we manage things remotely? How do we identify good local partners uh, that actually can help us do what it is that we want to do? And when we aren't primarily a self-implementing NGO. Um, but we see that we, we need to work more and more with local partners in order to be able to, to do what we want to do, which is to help refugees where they are. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we will see that there's more, more and more of this, that, we, that it, it needs to be a mix. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just just before I come to the next next person who's got their hand up, um, we want to really move, as I say, move into the area of what should humanitarian logistics and supply chain look like in five years time. So we are going to load some statements again uh, yeah. to see whether you and everybody thinks that they are um, which ones are, are should happen more than others. It includes, for instance, data analysis and machine learning will have a positive effect on the supply chain efficiency. So that's mm. that'll be one. Uh, humanitarian supply chains will be outsourced increasingly. Um, inclusion of localization and local partners in supply chain, humanitarian private sector supply, inclusion of environmental sustainable actions in supply chain and logistics will become common. So these are suggestions for everybody to look at and see whether you think that these are going to need to be there for, to, to make the, the sector good and healthy for the future or put other suggestions down as well. Mm. So um, who else should we bring in? Let's bring in um, Susan Hodgson. Hi. Hello there. Hi. I just save you looking on your list, save the children. <laughs> I remember you from the from the other session, so it's, it's all right, okay. I remembered. Um, and I will stick to that subject of, of, of five years because it does touch on some areas now. I, I, the localization agenda, I think that also leads into my colleague Christy and other people's discussion around cash and a purchasing power as, as international NGOs particularly. You know, there's a drive back to, I'm saying back to, but a drive towards we need to engage at a more local level. Um, you put my camera on, sorry. 
um, a much more local level, um, it, not, not, least of, not least of which that also drives the economy and it drives the countries which are working, which obviously that then helps uh, the families, the traders and everything else. That does reduce, and we've seen that over, we've seen that actually during COVID-19, the reliance on international freight, and uh, many of us are doing less and less international freight, we're doing much more at local. I do think that's the future. I, I do believe that more localization is the future. You mentioned environmental, that's already out there. Um, you'll see later on, I'm involved and some of my colleagues are involved. Save the Children, we have a sustainability pledge, we have a sustainability policy. We're, a lot of us are already in that game. And, and uh, interestingly, at the moment, we're just making it a requirement for all of our suppliers to give us sustainable options and, and what they're doing to do that. So I, that's already out there. So I think it's not what it looked like in five years. It's actually already there. It'll increase. Um, and I think we'll see more of it, but it is actually all out there. But do, does does that have a cost um, going down the yes. sustainable route? And and because of you know we've all, we we saw you know the COVID thing is going to have impact yes. on on resources. Uh, yes, it does have a cost, and this is where you know these engagements with our donors come in because it, it's often down to some you know where you get into good old humanitarian stuff is you've got the same amount of money. Do you do less beneficiaries and environmental impact? or do you do more beneficiaries because we are humanitarians? It's a very simplistic view, but yes, it does have a cost. So, um, but something else we're exploring with our supplier reviews is corporate social responsibility or whatever they call it now. Why are our corporate partners not supporting us in that with reverse logistics? Why does it have to come from donor money? We're not, we're not for profit. You know, is there commercial responsibility in there to actually put their hands up and say, we will, provide some of this for you as part of our corporate and social responsibility. It does link into cash program. And I just want to add before there's a question and cash program is, is strongly controlled, but you know, you do have to have a market. You have to have traders and suppliers to buy from if using cash. So it's not the solution for everything. Neither will it always be the solution for everything, but that shouldn't take away the fact that it should be something we look at for many, many reasons. Um, when we are looking at programming and moving away from our traditional methods of logistics for the future and um, digitalization totally yeah okay. yes totally yeah and what about um outsourcing we, we this is one of the things we put on i think what, that we're talking about humanitarian supply chain activities outsourced increasingly um yeah and a, a change in operational liabilities as a result of that some of that already happens. You know, there are many of us that already outsource perhaps security services, um, perhaps we're hiring vehicles. So it's not outsourcing isn't rare. Um, you could you could argue we call them sub grant agreements with partners. Are we not outsourcing to a national partner? So I think, you know, outsourcing is a very generic term and I, we're already doing some of that, whether we call it sub granting to partners or whether we outsource it to a security company. It is there. Um, we do use it. Will it take the sector on? I, I don't think so, because I just don't think it's the type of thing every corporate wants to engage in. But it is already out there. It is okay. already out there. Thank you very much indeed. And in fact, um, increased common services and solutions for procurement and logistics is topping the list at the moment. Um, uh, which also means common data requirements and standards. Um, Jason uh, Asimovic from Penn State University. Hi. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I heard you mention sort of, um, and I've heard this come up a lot, data analytics and machine learning and how that will play a role. I guess I just don't necessarily see a lot of that in the near term until we get the data question uh, underfoot. I mean, there's just so much to be, um, I think there's such a huge improvement that could happen if, if we just started having, like you said, data standardization, or just having the data there, which I don't see it really there right now. So until we can sort of get a lot of data, I think that there's a lot of other improvements to be made, not looking towards machine learning or advanced artificial intelligence concepts. But when you say, you mean the actual data is missing or the analysis of the data? Well, I think both like um, maybe each organization has its data, but if you wanna look at data across organizations, uh, or from one disaster to the next, um, a lot of that data is not out there in a format 
that it's easy to merge it and slice it and dice it and even start to analyze it, right? When we say analyze, sometimes that can just mean going to Excel and making a chart. But you have, but but 99% of the effort to do that, to provide that value is just getting that data in one spot. Um, so I think before we start looking towards tools like artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think just some simple Excel charts could provide a lot of value. Granted that across organizations and across disasters and such, we can get that data standardized, both the supply and the demand side of that. Well, interesting. I, I, I've never thought of an Excel chart as being a sort of, you know, an, an alternative to a data, data analysis, analysis, but interesting. Uh, let me bring in da Daniela uh, Jolman. Yeah, th thanks. Um, I, just to kind of build on that, because I think there's, this brings the question back that we had at the start of the day around what is the role of the cluster vis-a-vis -vis supply, wider supply chain and procurement, because I think that for a lot of products around product selection and product demand, there's quite a lot of data that's being collected. Is it being aggregated? No, it really depends on the sector. I mean, being from UNFPA, we have the global family planning van, the visibility and analytics network, which connects the private sector and then in-country demand and supply chain platforms and things like this. But I think that there's this data, which I would argue is also very inherently connected to program uh, decisions and, and program data collection through however our organizations collect that that information around services or things like this with then the logistics data and to inform logistics planning. So it's not just, I would say, individual data collection. I think it's also the interconnection between the fact that those um, organizations or people within organizations who collect pieces of data related to the program, which are inherently related to the, the supply and demand side of stuff, is talking to and connected to then that logistic planning data that's required, which I think the cluster has done a great job of in, in a lot of places and trying to visualize, you know, where is there a bridge that's down? Okay, well, these organizations have huge demand in this area for this population. How does that inform our planning? So it's also the interconnectedness of data. And the last thing I'll just say again, because I, I referenced it before, but I think in regards to some of the other conversations, I do think that when we're talking about the private sector, there is a really important kind of reckoning that we have to have around the, the humanitarian principle component of the conversation, both within subcontractors that we use in crisis settings, but then also um, at a wider level. Um, yeah, thanks. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I just got a message to say that uh, Gianji wants to, to I, I didn't see that somebody was waiting with, um, with their hand up. Uh, am I saying this correctly, the, the right name, Gianji? No worries. Um, yeah, I had been waiting for quite a long time. I I'm was, so sorry. I didn't. I, I'm not seeing. No worries. I, I took my hand down already. In fact, I, uh, it's, <laughs> I let it go. Oh, I'm so sorry. We are we're coming to an end, so you'll have to be quite brief. But I'm I'm really sorry. I just didn't see you. It's it's quite complicated seeing who's where. Carry yeah, on. sure. Uh, I think a lot of things have been said already, so I don't want to maybe repeat those. But there are some things that jump at me from previous research where. We've been looking at trends, we've been looking at what is coming up and so forth. And, and there are a few things that we maybe not haven't mentioned yet. One is the, the whole issue of security and both the security of like the physical movements and uh, material flows, but also of the, I mean, of course, now we've discussed the data part of it, but, uh, but still, I think a lot of the physical part is not solved, especially when uh, I think somebody mentioned access and um, in conflict zones and so forth. I mean, those kinds of things we still have to maybe have an eye on. And generally, I think that a lot of the things are still like back to basics, like even with COVID-19, back to like, okay, pre-positioning helped in certain areas more than um, more than in others. There was a comment earlier of that cash isn't this answer to everything. And, and even though COVID-19 itself pushed a lot of organizations to us using more cash where possible, it just isn't a possibility everywhere. So I think just to maybe come back to some of these things, and I know that there are going to be very good speeches also tomorrow and also in the marketplace about greening issues and more digitalization and so forth. So maybe we can just come back to those there. We will do. And um and we'll bring you in earlier in the conversation. Thank you very much indeed all for, for all your thoughts, everybody. I mean, quite quite clearly then, um, I, you know, COVID and, and lack of, you know, money and funding seem to be uh, one of the biggest influences. And partnership comes up very strongly and obviously digitalization, but uh, collaboration and partnership along with sustainability really important for the, for the future. Um, 
so we that gives us sort of some nice little bits that we can then feed into further discussions. Thank you very much indeed. And that's great. That was really lovely the way that even though I didn't see everybody with the hands up, but you know, the, the fact that you were so active is so lovely. Uh, 